Um, my name's Martin, I'm, I'm from Union Magazine. So in case you haven't heard of Union Magazine, we're an independent publication that focuses on different subcultures from around the world. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about my journey through some of those subcultures and how I've found that people often aren't what you first perceive them to be. But first a little bit about the internet. Now, yeah, that isn't actually, that's VR, but you know, the internet. Now, internet is rightly hailed as one of the greatest innovations in communications ever, you know, comparable to the evolution of speech in humans. But, you know, you can Skype your granny in Australia, update your Facebook, do your Instagram, order 28 weeks of shopping. It's amazing. You know, we couldn't live without it. But there has been a downside. People online tend to gravitate towards those that share similar beliefs. So to put it simply, right-wingers go to right-wing websites, left-wingers go to left-wing websites. So instead of being an open media of communication, it actually becomes a reinforcing tool, an echo chamber. And people online are often not seen as real humans with emotions and feelings, but rather as avatars of particular beliefs. And instead of being brought together by algorithms, we're actually being forced apart. So why is this? What is, what's behind this grouping? Now, I've always wanted to use a picture of K-Men, so there it is. Now, um, evolutionary psychologists believe it goes back to the days of the K-Men. Or prehistory, to be more correct. And back then, being part of a group or tribe that thought and looked like you was often the difference between life and death. You know, strangers meant danger. You know, strangers with red hair were coming to kill you, so keep away from them. So it was better to keep with the people you knew. Now, evolutionary psychologists believe this trait has come down to us till today, and leaving us with an inbuilt trigger to fear those that look or even think differently from us. So there you go. But sociologists think a bit differently. <clears throat> they believe people group together to be socially distinctive, to kind of, you know, be different from the mainstream, to either stick two fingers up to it with the way they look, the way they dress, or even at some times to be totally out of the mainstream, be unknown. One sociologist in the 60s, which always makes me laugh, he tracked down this particularly elusive group who, when they were found, weren't happy to be found. They had to change their entire look. They said, now you've found us, you've ruined it, the mainstream's going to find out. Please go away. <laughs> so what have I learned in my journey? OK, now, this is the East Bay Rats Motorcycle Club. They're in Oakland, California. They're called the Rats, not because, well, obviously not because they're rodents or anything, because they ride rat bikes. And these are bikes that are made to look like they've been ridden over a 1,000 miles and are really knackered. Um, and they're really into fire as well, <laughs> especially setting fire to the pavements. Um, and the night we went and visited them, they were holding a fight club. So you can imagine what that was like. Now, despite being pyromaniacs into fight clubs and bikers and the sort of guys you'd run away from if you saw them on a dark street, a lot of the rats had really good jobs in Silicon Valley. A couple worked for you know, a very famous search engine you all use every day. Another worked for that social network that begins with F and ends in K. Uh, one was a, a tour manager for bands, some of the best bands and most successful bands in the last 10 years. So what you see is not what you often get. But they weren't the nicest guys in the world. Well, they were, but they did have a particular prank that you may find offensive. Um, in California, beer cans are worth money. So what they would do, they would fill a shopping trolley full of beer cans and then take that, beer ca uh, that shopping trolley, I should say, and stick it to a lamppost. Now, the reason they did this was because the local homeless valued beer cans. And they would sit back and watch the homeless try all different types of tactics to get this shopping trolley from the top of the lamppost. Apparently, the record's four days. That's the quickest anyone ever did it. So, yeah, but I just want to say now that I, they, I really do love them. I want to go back to California. Please don't kill me. <laughs> right, so has anyone heard of Bronies? Yes? yes? OK, well, if you haven't, they're... Um, adult fans of My Little Pony, now, <laughs> which is a cartoon designed for kids aged six to nine, as you probably all know. And it's probably more designed to sell soft toys than anything. So why are these adults into My Little Pony? Well, the convention I went to, they told me it was because the cartoon taught them lessons about conflict resolution and how to overcome stresses and trials in their lives. Now, I'd gone along thinking everyone would be dressed like this guy here, and that they were all super freaks into it. But most of them were sort of regular people with, you know, families, mortgages, lives and jobs. You know, they just really loved the show. It really meant so much to them. So, for example, 
These two guys here, they both work in the Oklahoma oil industry. Now, on the rig, so they've got some of the most dangerous jobs in the industry, but they're bronies. So one of them got into it because their daughter told him, you know, he sat on his daughter on his knee and he watched it. And yeah, they couldn't tell their colleagues. The colleagues, they'd said to me, they said, if our colleagues find out we were bronies, we'd be ostracized. They would think we were gay or, you know, just very strange people. But they were determined to stay into the show. They, they believed it brought that much to them. They were willing to take that risk. And the guy on the right told me the formula to be a brony. So if you want to know, I'll tell you now. Basically, watch the first three episodes of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. And if you want to watch any more, then you're a brony. And you will <laughs> probably end up looking like that guy. <laughs> Which is not too bad. Um, anyway, not all the subcultures I've met have been that fluffy. This is um, Harry Hubbard. Now, Harry's a, a leading member of the American National Socialist Party. So Harry's an American Nazi. Now, Harry spends his day patrolling the border between Arizona and Mexico looking for illegal immigrants. He feels it's his patriotic duty to you know, stop them. He doesn't, even though he's got like a giant gun there, he doesn't shoot them or anything. He gives them water and calls the border patrol. Now, Harry had lots of views I found really reprehensible, but he was a nice guy. You know, he invited us into his house, which I don't know if you can see that, it's called Rancho Muerte, which for you non-Spanish speakers means ranch of death. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> he told us his views on life, the universe and everything. And at great length, he told us, even though he has a swastika on that shield, why he doesn't want to be called a Nazi. He found it derogatory. But there you go, he was a nice guy for a Nazi. <laughs> now, the next group, well, we're all familiar with Harry in 20th century German politics and what happened, but these are the Reelians. They're a UFO religion. And um, they were started about 40 years ago by an ex-French car journalist. So kind of imagine if Jeremy Clarkson, dis when he left the BBC, didn't go to Amazon, actually started a UFO religion, and then you're kind of... <laughs> getting where it is. Um, they believe we're all created by aliens, all life on Earth was created by an alien civilization that is going to come back within, I think, the next 30 years and save us. But um, they're probably, in, they've been in the press a few times over the last four decades, mainly for having, allegedly having, gigantic sex orgies at their gatherings. Now, I can't say whether that's true, because the gathering I went to I did not see any sex orgies, or I, well, I wasn't invited to any. But what I did find, <laughs> they could have been having them all around me for all I know. But what I did find were people who, as well as believing that Jesus, Buddha, and Moses are all living together on a planet a few light years from Earth, were, were down here on this planet, car mechanics, public relations consultants, and worked in the fashion industry. And over dinner, the main topic of conversation wasn't about Moses and Buddha's living arrangements. It was about how expensive dental care was in America and whether it was worth flying down to Mexico to get your teeth fixed. And I think everyone agreed it was. So <laughs> that's probably why they got such good teeth. Um, and also, they're really big fans of TED Talks. They watched them continuously when I was there, especially the ones about future society and future technology. So if you're watching, hello, we aliens. Please invite, please, please invite me to the sex orgy. I know this is turning into like a, like a, a, a parade of holiday snaps almost, but um, this one final group I'd like to talk about, uh, talk about. These are the illegal dirt bike bikers of Baltimore. Now, um, I'm sure a few of you have heard about Baltimore and its problems with drugs through the TV show The Wire. Now, these bikes here once played a pivotal role in that trade. They were used to ferry packages, packages of narcotics, hither and thither across the city. They were really prized because, you know, you can see there's parkland on the left. They can dodge cop cars. Cops will chase them, and they can just go, go across the ground. The cops will lose them. So, obviously, the police wised up to this and banned them within the city. So, it's illegal to have one within the city of Baltimore. They just pick them up and take them away and crush them. So, the kids weren't really going to stand for this. So what they do every Sunday is come out on their bikes and parade and pulling wheelies. They're, they're actually called the 12 o'clock boys because of the position of the bike. And they dare the cops to chase them and everything. Now, this was one of the hardest groups we ever tried to interview. Well, we did interview, I should say. They thought we were undercover FBI agents. 
So despite, we used to Instagram them sending pictures of ourselves holding newspapers saying, we're British journalists, we're British journalists, please, please let us come. They just weren't interested. So what we did, we just went to Baltimore, listened out for the bikes, and what we found was a group of kids, like kids anywhere else in the world, they were worried about going to college, they were worried about, you know, what their parents thought of them, you know, just normal children. But they were very particularly concerned about road safety in Baltimore. They felt that there were too many elderly drivers allowed on the road. And a couple of them, like one of these guys here's friend, had broke his leg the week before because uh, uh, what he described as a Mr. Magoo had run him off his bike and broke his leg. Now, I didn't know what was more shocking, the breaking of the leg, or someone still talks about Mr. Magoo. <laughs> so, you know. So, what have I learned on this journey? Well, one, there's a lot of people out there that are into a lot of different things in the world, which I know is very trite and obvious thing to say. And two, even more obviously, people are just people. You know, you can be a Nazi patrolling the border between Arizona and Mexico, but you still got to pay your water bill. You can be a biker who's, you know, sticking up shopping trolleys on top of lampposts and setting fire to the street. But come Monday morning, you still got to get up and go to work. You know, that's, that's what their lives are. They are no different from us. And what I've found is people should get on the internet and talk to these people, not try and change them or change their opinions or anything like that. Just listen, hear their journeys, hear what they've been through and hear what they say. Show, you know, show some empathy. And then you'll find that like the brony, the Nazi, the realien, well, maybe not the realien, they're not any different from us. They're not a different species. They are us. So basically what I'm trying to say is get out there and go and say hello to them. Thank you.